welcome to another South Tip Arts podcast. Donal O'Callagher is a filmmaker based in Clonmel here in County Tipperary. His production company Anu Pictures is based in the town and his latest project, The Camino Voyage, which began life as a four-part documentary and has since been condensed into a feature-length documentary and been released all over the world to great acclaim in an effort to highlight much of the wonderful but very quiet work that goes on around the area, I had a chance to speak to Donald about the Camino Voyage and the other projects that he has in the pipeline at the moment. The Camino Voyage gets a DVD release in the coming weeks and if you have a chance to see a screening of the film or indeed catch the DVD, it's highly recommended. Hope you enjoy. Donald, I've been a fan of your work since the John Moriarty film. That was the first time I ever came across John Moriarty. And it was really your film that brought that all to life for me. So I'm a big fan of what you do. And I know you're working on other things, but your most recent Camino by Sea film has really, it's grown legs in a way, hasn't it? It began as... It has. As a four-parter. Yeah, I like to think of it as a, as, a, as a child that's grown up and it's kind of graduated from university and it's gone out into the world and it's doing its own thing now. Yeah. Um, somebody emailed me last week and they said they'd seen it somewhere and I wasn't, I mean, we knew that it was screening there, but we kind of lost track of it because mm. it's been screening so much around the place and everything. We had a screening in Jordan recently, in Amman. Wow. <laughs> it's going to screen in Ethiopia in That's as incredible. part of the European uh, Travelling Film Festival. They pick one film from each country and they pick mm. the Camino Voyage to represent Ireland. So it's going to all these amazing places. I mean, it's screened all the way now from Moscow all the way to Hawaii. It's been <laughs> subtitled in Russian, in Arabic, French, Portuguese, Spanish, everything. And we're finally going to have our French premiere on November 16th, actually, but closer to home. Yeah. So yeah, so it's 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 um it's on its own journey at this stage. And then also it was released in cinemas in the States, in Canada, New Zealand, Australia and the UK. So it's been great. Yeah, no, it's been really And you've won a bunch of awards first. Yeah, it's it? it's won four or five awards. Four awards yeah. anyway. Where's that? Yeah. <laughs> Have um, a special shelf? <laughs> no, no, it's on the back of the DVD again. Um, yeah, no, it's won four awards so far, so it's been, been doing great. And I know it's about a journey, but the whole thing, it's a journey on its own in the making of it. So it began as the four-part documentary that was screened on TG Cahar. I know you weren't on the screen, but you took that voyage just like the rest of them. Yeah, you definitely. Know? You know, it, it went through, like all big projects, it went through its own traumatic thresholds I guess mm. you know and even from a filmmaking point of view I was hired to direct it by RTE in the first year and in the second year so so they got as far as France the first year which was mm. pretty amazing they got as far as Brittany and nobody was really sure if that boat would even get across to the UK you know to Wales so um, so the second year RTE I, I'd been bugging them for 10 months saying okay we need a confirmation that we're going to continue this mm. because it was based over three years mm. lads went out six weeks every year over three years so in the second year I was I was on to RTE for about 10 months saying come on can we get confirmation I need to start planning for next mm. year mm. and finally a month I'd say it was a month maybe three weeks before they were due to go out in 2015 for the second year RTE decided they were no longer funding it <sighs> So I was left left basically scrambling. You know, it was an RTE project. Mm-hmm. They hired me as director. And I was livid. I went up and had, had requested a meeting with the two commissioning editors. And um, there were a lot of expletives during <laughs> the meeting imagine. and everything. Mm-hmm. But um, I was livid, really, really livid. So I said, look, I'll take over this as a production. But, you know, a few weeks before it's restarting and it's too late to go somewhere else to find funding. So I'll take it over. But I need money from you guys mm-hmm. just to cover basic, you know, expenses mm-hmm. And to cover the insurance, you know, just mm. for this year. And I'll just, you know, I'll just, I'll just take it over and do it myself, you know. So I took it over. And then, so for the third year, we had already two, two years of filming. And by the third year, they had gotten to northern Spain. And, mm. you know, it, it was kind of fait accompli that they would get to Santiago, hopefully. And um, so I went to TG Cahar and I went to BAI and we managed to raise the money to fund that part of it. So it, it was interesting because at the beginning I was hired by RTE and, you know, I'm from Cork and all the crew are from Kerry. So, you know, there's a little bit of, not suspicion, but a little bit of tentativeness around, you know, RTE sending a Cork man to film a bunch of Kerry men. But, you know, in the second year when I came out and filmed it, you know, we were we were filming out of the back of Aidan Minnick's car. Yeah. So from Bob Kelly, who was amazing. And uh, then I couldn't even afford to bring Bob out for part two, so I had to go out by myself. 
and film it. And basically, Aidan Minnock is a retired builder who was a friend of Liam Holden's who was going along anyway. Yeah. And he was good enough to, to bring us along in his station in Wagon. So, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a disaster financially and stuff, as mm. documentaries usually are. Mm. But the thing that it did was, you know, I remember Danny and the lads were just kind of, their attitude changed mm. towards the filming. You know, it was no longer, you know, somebody being sent from RTE to make a documentary on them. Somebody was actually pouring themselves into this project as much yeah. as they were. And yeah. by year two, they really decided, oh, my God, you know, you're as much a part of this project as we are. You know, because we were camping alongside them and everything and we had no money. So it wasn't as if we yeah. were. And big chunks you know, of time spent together. like Massive. massive all day, every day. Massive. Yeah, massive. long days. Yeah. Um, so, you know, by, by year two, we were definitely part of the journey. We, yeah. we really were, you know. And um, um, obviously Danny passing away in the... At what point did that happen? He's was such a beautiful after. soul. Oh, my God. What a lovely man. I know, I know. Yeah. But just he came across as such a lovely soul. I know. Yeah. We were sitting here in Questum in Clonmel where we edited. Um, mm. We had the editor room next door and we had all... You know, we had we, we saw 200 hours of footage over three years and yeah. I think you saw that graph on the wall. Did, I yeah. did, I did, yeah. 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 And we made a map because we had to, um, I had to hire motion designers to do the maps for the mm. films and everything during post-production. I remember it Danny came and we looked at the wall and he looked at the map and he was just like, Christ, did we do that? You know, because, you know, it didn't, yeah. it's, you know, when you're in the middle of something, mm. you're in it, but then you step back out of it and you yeah. see the, see the scale Feel of the it. thing. Yeah. You know, when we saw it on the map, he was like, God, he couldn't believe, believe it. it. Yeah. You know, couldn't yeah. really believe it because we had, we had, we were beginning to plot it out in the map yeah. for the motion yeah. designer and everything. But Danny passed away the year after um, we got to Santiago because they continued mm. the journey down towards Port Hill. Right. And that's when the accident happened. Okay. And then, you know, that happened before the feature-length film was finished mm, and out mm. in the world. But Danny had already seen the, min- the miniseries. And um, I'm so glad because I remember he called me from Dingle and he, he, he said, Donald, I've been on the radio and I've been on the newspaper and I've been giving talks and everything about this journey for the last three years. Mm. And he said, and nobody got it. And he said, finally, that they've seen this, they got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I was so happy because they felt like their story was getting across. Yeah. And listen, if you make a documentary and nobody likes it, but the people who are in, in it feel like their story was told, yeah, sure that's, then I feel like I've yeah, achieved something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Danny, God, like a massive loss. I mean, he was, you know, after um, our, our son was born just during the, the initial broadcast mm-hmm. in 2016, actually. Mm-hmm. And about 10 days later, Danny called, he was on his way to Dublin for a meeting and he was, mm. you know, he used to come and stay with us on his way up and down from Dingle. Yeah, lovely. And he was just, uh, he, he just called and he said, "In chance to go or lab, you know, Dairdeen, yeah, Dairdeen, tell me, or I'm bohr gudi bala hatli or krunu with our shula, you know, I'm, I'm any chance of a bed on the road to, to mm. Dublin on Thursday? And I was like, God, um, Danny, Josephine and I were all wrecked. Like, you know, it's two weeks, our first child. Yeah. We, we haven't slept in two weeks. <laughs> And I was thinking, A, we wouldn't be very good hosts and, yeah. and B, he probably wouldn't have a, he wouldn't get a night of sleep, sleep, you know. So I was thinking, God, maybe, and, and I would never refuse Danny anything. Mm. And after I said it, I felt a bit bad. And there was a bit of silence on the phone. And I thought, mm. God, I'm, after offending him now. <laughs> and then he just stopped for a He said, you're a big shift character, He said, you'll be grand, he said. <laughs> and he came and he, he stayed. He came coming anyway. <laughs> yeah, he came anyway and he stayed. And you know what, it was lovely. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we, we all got very close over the three journeys. And then after the loss of Danny, I mean, we all became really close because yeah, we kind of had yeah, to, sure to get through you all it. Together. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, no big journeys like that. They come with their, you know, they come with their celebrations and they come with their challenges. Yeah, so. yeah. And his replacement being Glenn, was it? No, no. Glenn replaced Brendan Moriarty. Right, OK. Brendan yeah. Moriarty was the stonemason on it. Long term unemployed. That's okay. where he was able to come for six weeks. OK, yeah, yeah. Um, but then he got a full time job oh, in 2016. Yeah, yeah, well, you don't turn that down. And uh, he called Danny and said, geez, what will I do? I got this full-time job. Mm. You know, it's like, uh, funnily enough, it's in the Blasket Centre where there are oh, naval yes. oaks looking yeah, up at yeah. Blaskets and the water and everything. OPW job. And Danny was like, ah, oh, you'd be a fool not to take that. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So we were joking with Brendan Moriarty because we were saying, God, they had to find an Oscar winner to replace you. That was, <laughs> that was the Oscar. That was the running joke. Yeah. You know? Very good. That whole. must have brought its own bit of profile. Did it or? You know, when we heard about it first, I had ne- I'd never met Len and I didn't even know Len's music because I lived in the States for 20 okay, years. Right. So I didn't really know. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows of Once and the Oscar and everything like that. Yeah, but, but the frames, yeah. I didn't know the frames at all. I know, yeah. like the frames have such a massive following. And, have um, some energy in their life. Wow. 
Yeah, and we were all kind of like, oh, celebrity on the boat. I don't think so. This is going to ruin. We we had a beautiful film, and Brendan Moriarty is like the soil of the earth, and Uh, he's also related to John Moriarty. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we were like, oh, my God, you know, Glenn, I don't know about this. So, Mm. you know, Danny said, the first thing Danny said was like, who is this fellow? Because he didn't know who he was. And then his daughter told him. And after his daughter told me, he said, no, Tashi Rochalul, he's too famous. Yeah, There'll be yeah. too much problems with famous people on the boat. You know. So Glenn was invited down for dinner in Danny's house. And he came down for dinner and they had the dinner and everything. And, you know, that's the way Danny would do things. and just yeah. talk to people, yeah, listen yeah. to them and talk to them. Yeah. And after the dinner, he came over and he put out his hand to Glenn. He said, Glenn, you're welcome on the boat. He said, there's only three rules. And if you can keep them, you're, you're more than welcome. And Glenn said, what are the three rules? He said, well, the three rules of the boat are there's no captain... There's no complaining and there's no anger. And Glenn said, I'm fine with that. So he said, tough all to roll the board. So that's how brilliant. Glenn came on. Yeah. And um, Glenn was brilliant. Yeah. Like, he's a real genuine, oh my God, he mm. is. He's, he's the genuine thing, mm-hmm. you know. Um, heart of gold, do anything for anybody, genuinely. He, de- he definitely comes across that way as a character. But um, a difficult enough thing to step in onto your little kind of group as well it's and old. fit in well, you know you know as as Glenn would say himself he's from you know he's a dub and we didn't find out until after he's a massive fear of the sea one of the reasons he wanted oh, to do it was to overcome his fear of the sea oh right okay and he was sick as a dog for the first two weeks I mean he's a musician mm. so he's a night owl he, he's up all night playing gigs and yeah, you know yeah. um, daytime doesn't you know doesn't <laughs> really suit so it was a massive ask you know but um, but he was brilliant he really he was re- he was really he just he just did whatever he needed to do. Also, he brought his own music. And Danny says it in the film. We were asking Danny about, you know, would Glenn work out or not? And he said, you know, one of the main reasons that, that I think Glenn will work out, he has the wildness, you know? And it's not like uncontrollable wildness. He has mm. that wildness, meaning he's in contact with his own inner yeah, wildness, yeah, you know? Yeah, like yeah. that wildness mm. of the landscape the lads have in bucketfuls coming yeah, from the yeah, Dingle yeah. Peninsula, you know? And Glenn does have that somehow mm. coming out of Dublin and Ballyfermot and everything, coming out of that whole situation. He has he has that connection to the rawness of yeah. being alive. And um, Danny felt like, you know, I think Danny got a sense of that from mm. him when he came down. Mm. He had dinner and stuff, and that's why he felt like he would work. That was the main mm. reason. Fientus. I mean, it's one of the... If there's one word that really describes the journey, it's the fientus, oh, you know, the wildness yeah. of it. You know, it's yeah. like that, that wildness that we all have in Irish culture, mm. you know. I think that's one of the things living on this rock this rugged rock on the western seaboard of yeah. europe you know we're a very different tribe to the rest of europe in that way yes, and, and the further yeah. west you get the more you feel that you know yeah yeah so um so the fientus absolutely it was a lot about the fientus you know? and how long like in terms of logistically you, you were obviously on another boat to do the the filming was that um was that something that you found difficult trying to yeah i mean i i was never on a boat a small boat like that out at sea in my life you know yeah. so i was sick as a dog for the first week as well we were on uh paddy barry's shakaron it's a sail right, it's okay. a sailing boat like a 40 foot 60 foot it's a big yeah. long one anyway yeah no it's probably 80 foot something pretty long anyway but it's made for sailing and sailing boats go really fast but the Navog doesn't go fast yeah so you keep in pace with them so Paddy it was kind of frustrating for Paddy I think because he had to keep the old diesel engine on all the time just to keep it ticking over to move forward but the sails mm-hmm. were down we did very little sailing on that mm-hmm. sailboat just to keep alongside the lads so diesel fumes and rocking around and you know, mm. water is, you know, because usually sailing but slide over the water and it's a yeah. beautiful experience, but we were just popping you around. You must have got fairly you know? battered a few times out there, like, is, there was, did you get caught in any weird stormy we, weather that you didn't anticipate? We did, we did. We were crossing the English Sea and uh, we got caught in a storm. That's that's in the film where the lads mm. had to kind of come on board our boat. So um, we all battened down, like in situations that you just battened down. So yeah. Bob Kelly and I, the cameraman, we were in the front of the boat mm. and we were underneath this hatch that's meant to be waterproof. But as the storm got bigger, suddenly there was this massive bang. It was one of the biggest bangs I've ever heard in my life. And the waterproof hatch wasn't waterproof under those conditions. Mm. So Bob and I got up, scrambling around in our underwear, just trying to see, because all our gear was in the room as well, because you're on this tiny boat, you know, and uh, we were just scrambling to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first thing, both of us, Mm. up, just to get all the gear out Mm. of the room, into the narrow passageway to Mm. see what was wet, what wasn't wet, what needed to be Mm. wiped down, what needed to be cleared and stuff. So 
Um, so yeah, we had a few incidents along the way. But oh, the thought of losing like stuff that you'd shot or oh, jeez, uh, yeah, that kind drastic because yeah. that's irreplaceable. Yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. When you're out on the boat, it's not like at least when we were on land, we could give a, a backup drive to someone and say, okay, yeah, keep that, that away. Yeah. When you're at yeah. sea, you, it's yeah. all there, you know. Oh my god! Yeah. But fortunately, we didn't lose too much. We lost um, we lost a, 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 a mic port on one of the cameras. And we lost a few of the GoPro smaller cameras between water damage and stuff like that. But fortunately, nothing too major. Nothing it was a miracle, really, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just fascinated that would you say that taking that journey has changed the way that you operate? Do you see things differently now? Was it that big for you, like? Um, it was, you know, it was kind of hard to come back to regular it's life. years, you know, it's, it's almost like your life for how long? Totally, yeah. Yeah, you know. I, I was talking to Glenn the other day because I'm, I'm, we're doing two music videos for Glenn's new album. There yeah. were two tracks that were inspired by the Camino, um, so we're kind of going back into the footage. So I was talking to Glenn the other day, and Glenn said this about the trip. He said, you know, it changed my idea about making music, that journey. Mm. And he said it also changed my idea about how to keep and make friendships, make and keep friendships, he said. you know, That's so profound. Like, it, is. Yeah. it is, it mm. is. And uh, it did, no, it, it was um, really changed, really changed, you know, how you see, I, I think I found it really difficult to come back to regular life. Mm. Um, I remember walking with Brendan Begley, we were walking through uh, Lorient, mm. just the port, Port Louis, just outside Lorient in Brittany. We were walking down the street one day and we heard a vacuum, somebody was vacuuming their house. And we just looked at each other and we, we were like, that's the most bizarre sound, you know, because, you know, when you're out living in tents and uh, <laughs> yeah, camper yeah. vans and stuff like yeah. that, there's no dust really, you know, and to live in such a contained life, the way we live in square houses yeah, and square yeah. rectangular rooms all the time. Um, I found it very hard. I still find it very hard because a lot of making films is sitting in an office like this, you know, yeah. um, writing, producing, raising funds and mm, all that stuff. Mm, you know, mm. if you're if you're actually doing creative stuff 30 percent of the time, you're doing well. And um, I found it very hard to come back to sit mm. in in a in a square building after being out on that because it seems like a much more natural way to be actually because mm. you're you're rising with the sun you're going down with the sun mm. you're traveling with the weather like yeah. you're basically waiting for the weather the rhythms to, you're following the totally yeah yeah, yeah yeah and we had to lose all that because you know when you're scheduling it was one of the things with rte it was a bit weird because they were like we want to know where you'll be when you'll be and we were like we have no we idea know, like, where we'll be or when we'll be yeah. there you know so it from a production scheduling point of view it was a nightmare the first year because we were trying to schedule it the way you would schedule a production yeah. and by the second year and plus they're carrymen so they have their own way of doing things <laughs> on top clock. of everything else their own <laughs> yeah. clock definitely um so by year two and then by year three we kindly i think by year three we finally figured out okay we just need to follow the boat and yeah. wherever the boat goes we go yeah. and, and, and and that's what we were doing but we we're trying to schedule things and do all that and we we're like no you just yeah. have to follow the the boat and, and the boat had its own pace and you know what that boat is in sync a lot more with the planet how the planet works yeah. than most of how we live in mod modern day life yes you know so it was kind of hard hard to step back from that very natural way of being in mm -hmm. sync with the flow of 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 this beautiful planet we live on and then step back into the way that we live, which is so totally out of sync, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with, with the world. And, and of course, we're seeing re repercussions for that way of living mm -hmm. all of the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that's been, that's been a hard one. I'm still, str I'm still mm -hmm. struggling with that one, actually. And how do you follow this up? You know, what do you do next? So you probably had other things in pre-production anyway, had you during this? Or? Yeah. Well, look, here are the piles <sighs> of all my other projects oh my God, that are going at the stuff. moment. At the moment, I'm in post-production. I Heard Music is a new musical collaboration with um, between Fiona Keller and Cuivin Valdi. It's going to premiere on November 23rd down in Fuscri. And um, I'm doing the visuals for it. So that's one piece that's in post-production at the moment. And then Continuing Traditions is a musical collaboration between Padar Orieda and mm. Ustad Vajahat Khan, Ooh. master Indian musician. Oh, wow. And it's kind of funny because when I came back from the States 20 years ago, my first conversation with Padre Arida was about Indian music because I loved Indian music. Yeah. And uh, now 10 years later, he's doing a collaboration with this master of Sarod, Indian classical music okay. musician. It's going to be and a very interesting collaboration now between them. Yeah. We filmed most of that and uh, we're in post-production, so hopefully that'll be done by the end of the year. And then tomorrow I'm going to Dublin. I'm filming a new film called Six Zen Gifts. Um, there's going to be the installation of the first... Zen teacher on the island of Ireland 
will happen on Monday. There's a Zen retreat going on starting on Thursday all the way to Monday. So we're up filming that first thing in the morning, actually, and the installation. So that's that's kind of, that's one of the other main projects. I'm, I'm, so there's always bunch. There's always projects on the go. Dare I ask you about the Red Book one? The Red Book, absolutely. This is a collaboration with Matthew Mather, who's who's a lecturer yeah, here at LIT, yeah. and uh, an amazing mind, an amazing character in relation mm. to Young and anybody mm. who's related to lots of things around here in Clonmel will know Hello. of Matthew and yeah. Lynn mm-hmm. and their art and psyche symposiums. So uh, the Red Book is still in development. We're still looking for an international producer to collaborate yeah. with to bring it yeah. to life. But we've already um, we've assembled an amazing team. Sonu Chandasamy, is, who's the editor of the Red Book, is on board okay. as a creative wow. advisor. And Bettina Wilhelm, Wilhelm who's the granddaughter of mm-hmm. Wilhelm Reich, who translated the I Ching into from Chinese, she spoke is part at the college of it. A couple of years ago, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah. was here. So she's part of. So we've got this amazing creative team. So um, we're basically in development at it's the moment. It's like it's such a slow process, isn't it? It's interesting. Sometimes, um, sometimes they they happen really quickly, and sometimes they take a long time. time and yeah. I'm kind of beginning to appreciate the term organic process. I, 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 I presume you learned that from the you know the way you worked on the Camino trip because you ended up finding your own flow. Just, totally. And a different dynamic of people would have probably found a different flow again. So. Totally. And I suppose every project's like that, is it? They kind of are. And, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like trying to grow a tree. Like an oak tree takes mm. 100 years to reach full maturity. Mm-hmm. And if you try to pump it up and stuff and make it, you know, be That's fully mature in 10 yeah. years, something's going to fundamentally go wrong. A lot of patience required yeah. to just stick with things, you know, over... Yeah, um, and not going to go. Oh, it's not going to work. I know, yeah. I know, I know. I think the the red book is 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 a really important book for us because God, like, probably never been done before, something like that. So it hasn't. It, yeah, it's the first film know, on the red book as well as everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. And then also Young's insight, Carl Young's insight. It's really key for us at the moment. You know, mm-hmm. it, as a species on this planet, mm-hmm. we're going through a massive crisis, and. Um, I think Jung in the Red Book basically journeyed deep within his own psyche to kind of confront, yeah. you know, the unconscious. Yeah. And um, I think that journey, you know, he did he did what John Moriarty did, you know, on, on a really kind of global scale, mm. really. And there's lessons there to be learned from his journey that I think can help us as a species to mm-hmm. move, move forward. I mean, that's really that's really the kind of film that we'd like to make. You know, yeah. something that would be valuable valuable contribution to yeah 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 navigate all the it's turmoil really legacy that pieces, we're seeing kind of yeah, thing, yeah yeah but so is this one the Camino one really is too isn't it definitely yeah, yeah. like the depth yeah. of it and the reaction to it and just have you been in a room a particularly big room where it's on like how how do you feel it's funny because i have made a lot of effort to go to as many screenings as i can um but even with um you know the red book and i'm working on a climate consciousness film idea okay, as yeah. well you know, with climate consciousness now, I mean, I was talking to Monachan McGann recently, he was mm. down to Cashel Arts Festival. Monachan's a travel writer. Mm. And even he was saying, you know, I feel like I, I was offered to go to Ethiopia to write about travelling to Ethiopia. Mm. And he said, now with my awareness of what's going on, I feel yeah. like I can't, I can't do that. A, because I can't have the carbon footprint of going there. But then yeah. if I go there and write about it, others will go. So there's a bit of a crisis about, yeah. you know, carbon footprints and stuff. Yeah. So, like, we had our American premiere in Newport in California, mm-hmm. the Newport International, Newport Beach International Film Festival, right. which is massive, you know. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't go. Yeah. I, I didn't want to go because you were thinking I, California is a, yeah. week, a week journey away. Yeah. You know, it's a week to go there. And it was just like, you know, it was a big thing to have a premiere there and everything. But I just felt like I couldn't really justify it. You know, there wasn't a market there or anything, you know, mm-hmm. so I couldn't really justify going on a plan mm-hmm. that, on a, on a journey like that mm-hmm. in terms of carbon footprint, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, now we did go to New York because I'm from New York. I have family in New York, so it was yeah. a big, it was a big chance to meet with friends and stuff. Mm-hmm. And also, I was filming Six Zen Gifts while I was over there, so I was yeah. doing other things. Yeah. But going to California, we were invited to Australia as well. I was like, no, I can't go all the way to Australia just for a screening. Yeah, you know, yeah, even yeah. if it's flights paid in a hotel and everything, that's. Yeah. You can't justify that in this day and age. Now, yeah. if I could go down and... Well, if everybody thought like that, the way you think, we, we could definitely make a difference, you know? I know. Well, we're, we need to start thinking that way. And, and the Red Book is a film that will kind of get to our psyche, you know, our psyche relationship with what's mm-hmm. going on. And then I've got another film called... Uh, well, it's tentatively called Gaia Consciousness, or Climate Consciousness, right. because I think there's this amazing awareness that's erupting all around really us. Is. Um, you see it in the Extinction Rebellion... 
protests, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. people have issues with, but you know, mm -hmm. it's raising people's awareness about mm -hmm. what's going on. And um, we really need to transform the way we live. Definitely, we there's do. no easy way to do it. Sure, there isn't like no, a few no. eggs have to get broken on the way. <laughs> there's no Jesus, yeah. You know, you a can't. Lot, yeah, a, a lot of old preconceptions yeah. have to get broken along the way. You know, and uh, it's not that difficult. Our grandparents lived in sync with the planet. You know, yeah. we're only we're only a generation and a half away from living more in sync with the planet. Um, I mean, as a kid, I remember when the first head of cabbage was bought in our house. Right. And we were almost embarrassed, you know, because my dad yeah. was um, my dad was a gardener. He was he was a gardener, and then um, he died when I was pretty young and stuff. So yeah. we didn't have all the whole fresh vegetables and stuff like that. Yeah. And it was a sad day for us when we had to buy vegetables yeah. from a supermarket. It was weird because it was, alien, -like it was yeah. alien. A the fact that there was the expense of it, which yeah. was an expense, yeah. but B the fact that it wasn't coming out of your own soil. You didn't know mm. who made it. Yeah. It was a weird thing, yeah. you know. So, I mean, like, I remember those days. Those days aren't that long ago. And, you know, I, I walk around Tipperary now and there's apples everywhere because they're falling off trees everywhere. Yeah. And then you go into Super Value and there's apples from Brazil. I know, it's crazy. How it? does that make yeah. sense? You know? I don't know. So we have to fundamentally change the way that mm. we live. And it's not that difficult. It's, it's going to benefit everybody. Mm. It, do, it doesn't benefit the Brazilians to be shipping apples halfway across the world, no. you know? And yeah. it doesn't benefit us to be, you know, letting apples... For how long are the apples there before they actually get to your mouth? That's the other side. Well, how long does it take? I know. You know. I pulled an apple for my son out of our tree in the front garden mm. last week and I brought it in, I cut it open and within... T it was sitting around for 30 seconds and it was yeah. already going off. And I'm like, how the hell does an apple come I all know. the way from Brazil? Yeah. You know, and you're... Whatever they're doing to the apples mm. to make them last that long, mm. you're, you're bringing that into your body I as actually well. had occasion to taste a grape that somebody had grown here in Ireland. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh my god i've never eaten a grape clearly because no. they never tasted like these ones no now they were small but oh my god they were divine totally <laughs> what you buy in the supermarket i don't know what they are i know but they don't even go off i so. know i know i know no we have a thing now we have a compost and we we were putting tea bags into the compost mm. and all the tea bags were coming back out the other side everything else was composting except these tea bags so like the there's ammonia in tea bags which i didn't know really yeah in, in the in the bag itself right. you know so, you know, it's interesting that these tiny worms are smart enough not to bother with these tea bags. Imagine, yeah. And yeah, yet but we, we're not. <laughs> totally. We, as a supposedly advanced yeah. human race, are consuming all of this stuff. And Gosh, I didn't know that about tea bags. Oh, That's yeah. very sad. I know, I know. Well, are, okay. if you get organic tea bags well, or loose tea. Or loose tea. Go back to the way with yeah. the strainer. Yeah. yeah. What's yeah. wrong with that? Yeah. We can read the tea leaves <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> And I remember when we were buying tea bags when we were young, our grandmother was like, oh, I wouldn't be using that. That's all dust and weird stuff. But yeah. we were thinking, oh, grandmother's so backward. The poor woman, you know, from the countryside. What does she know, you know? And, you know, she was right, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, all... If you see a theme in my films, it's a lot about readjusting our relationship to the world around mm -hmm. us. It really is, you know? Mm -hmm. Even with the Hula Kiol, I heard music, uh, all of that footage comes from the landscape down around Muscari and stuff, mm. you know, which is where my, my grandparents my, and I come from yeah. originally, uh, the Gaeltuk area. And they have such a strong relationship with the landscape and the area that they mm. come from. And um, I, I think in, in, in modern life, we're kind of on a journey to repair that relationship to the place that we come yeah. from, you know. I don't think there's any excuse for it here, whatever about, like in Ireland, there's really no excuse because... We really aren't that far removed from it. No, I mean, no, totally not. Yeah. No, we're not. We're I don't not. know why do we get, get them small, get them while they're small and just re-educate them or something. I like, know. There's no point trying to re-educate ignorant adults sometimes. <laughs> is there? I mean, they just some people just aren't going to change. Well, you know, it's amazing. I think with the Camino Voids, one of the reasons why I go to screenings is because there's. it's amazing how people come to you after and they just, they just, they just have so much gratitude, you know? Yeah. And what they're seeing and what they're, what they're sharing in terms of what they get out of it, they're like, thank you so much because A, they're proud to be Irish, you mm -hmm. know? And it's not a nationalist thing. It's not a drum rolling yeah, thing like we're yeah, better than other yeah. people. It's just proud of being who you are and yeah. where you're from, you know? And then also within the Irish language, there's a certain understanding you know, Danny's use of the word fiendus is not used mm. lightly, mm. you know. Danny, is, you know, Danny is, grows up in an area where the mythology is part of the landscape. Mm. And he's very aware of that, you know, and mm. that manifests in who and how they are, you mm. know, and that really manifests in the story. I really feel that in the Camino mm. Voyage. It's not really dealt with explicitly, but it's dealt with implicitly, and people get it when they go to see mm. it, you know, because they feel like, okay, that's our story. You know, it's yeah, this yeah. tiny little boat on this massive ocean i mean that's the irish story yeah that's the yeah. individual story we all yeah, relate to something yeah, like that yeah. you know 
So um, I, I think with my work, if, if you can drop a little ocean of awareness into people's understanding, everybody's aware and everybody's got a potential to change and everybody's mm. got a, a desire to change as well. Mm. So I think if you share with them ways that other people are transforming and changing, I yeah, think they get inspired it's by that to it's do It's almost so an example to somebody rather than trying to preach something at them. Totally, it's yeah. It's a nicer way to do it. No, it's, it's a question of energy, really, and what people do with their energy. So in my work, if that, if that helps to manifest people's energy towards you know, a, a change or transformation mm-hmm. that they want to do, then that's a success for me. Yeah. You may not make a great living doing it. You know, it might be a, lot, a bit of a struggle and stuff, but that's a success, you know? So, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And a good philosophy for working and for life in general. Hopefully. Donald, thanks a million for your time. Um, really appreciate it. And um, best of luck with all these myriad projects that you have around the floor here Thanks. and that's it for another south tip arts podcast if you'd like to get in touch the email is south tip arts podcast at gmail.com that's south tip arts podcast at gmail.com talk to you next time